A very warm welcome to all of our participants today to our Aspen Transatlantic webinar, which is not only transatlantic, but really global. I especially greet many ambassadors and members of embassy from around the world. Over 10 members of embassies and ambassadors are with us today. A special welcome to you. And my name is Rudiger Lenz. I am the director of the Aspen Institute and I especially welcome our two guests of today, Bob Zerlick and Dr. Stormy Annika Mildner. If you see them both, now you can already see something very special about both persons whom I will introduce a little bit later. Bob has as a backdrop a German expressionist painting that maybe shows his German ancestry, which he's very proud of. And Stormy, as a strong transatlanticist, as well as someone who live, has lived in the United States, has a backdrop of Chicago. How, could, how good could it be shown that there is still existing strong transatlantic ties? So thank you to both of you. And we will start now in due time. Thanks, Bob, for joining us. And thanks, Stormy, very much. I will introduce you in a minute. But before, for all of you who are joining us, uh, many of you are already experienced Zoomers, and you are very well advised in the virtual rooms. But let me say for the others how we are going to proceed. Uh, we have some rules and regulations. On your task list, up, down, down on the bottom, you find a Q&A, F and A, where you can write your questions if you want to participate. And then I, as a moderator, will read those questions to our two guests. Second, you have a hand, a virtual hand, which you can raise. That will give our director, Laura, whom you don't see at the moment, but she's in the background and watching us closely. She then will help you to enter the room and then you can pose your questions audio, in audio and directly to our two participants. So, and thirdly, um, there's also a nine star nine option for those who have chosen to join us via telephone, where you can also pose your questions via telephone. This is on the record and will be later on put on YouTube. And thirdly, there's also three questionnaires which we would like to put in front of you because we think that we want to have also your meanings, your impressions, your fears, your concerns, or uh, your optimism about the topic which we are dealing about today. So now, short introductory remarks to both our guests of honor today. Bob, most of you, I don't have uh, Bob to introduce you to, 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 to the audience, but for the ones who might not have heard all stories about her, that will take out. But let it make sure. He held some serious senior positions in several US governments as trade representatives, deputy secretary of state, and uh, he was also close advisor to many presidents. And then he became president of the World Bank. And besides that, he also has a stellar career in business, where he served at Fannie Mae, where he served uh, with at, at very several large banks. So I think he has a, for Germans, is very, very strange. Uh, the, the, the political side is combined that much with the economic side. So Bob, we are very glad to have you with us and we will certainly listen to your take on our topic, which is so close to us as a leading export nations. And here I come to Stormy. Stormy, Annika Mildner has already a long career in uh, global politics as far as economics is concerned. She worked with several think tanks and she holds now a senior position at the BDI, the German Asso Trade Association a trade and industry association, uh, which is deeply involved in the G7 and G20 talks. She knows her subject. She's a close friend of, uh, of the United States. And by the way, she is a board member of ESPM, where we are very proud of to have you serving us as well as the BDI. Thank you very much, Stormy, for joining us. So many of you already um, are interested now about the topic. We will uh, go forward in the following way. Um, Bob will start with a short uh, introductory remarks about what his take is 
The ones who have followed this topic uh, might have read a lot, which she wrote in the last couple of weeks and months, especially in the Wall Street Journal. So he has very strong position on our topic, and we are eager to listen to what those positions are. And then we will follow it by a short comment uh, from the European German slash European German side by Stormy, because we are not only affected by what we're talking about, we are also a player. At least some people look up to us becoming a stronger player. This will be one of the topics we want to deal with as well. And so with no further ado, Bob, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, guten Tag, and thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I have great respect for the work of Aspen Berlin and Ruth Erdiger in, in uh, particular, and it's a pleasure to be here with Stormy. Uh, BDI was always one of the strong free traders uh, in my era, so I appreciate uh, that commitment. Uh, as Rudiger mentioned, to get us started, I'm going to open with five brief points about U.S.-China relations. First, when President Xi assumed office in 2012, he prepared a documentary film about the end of the Cold War. And he directed all the party cadres to see the film. Now, if such a film were developed in Germany, it would probably have Gorbachev as being the hero who ended the Cold War. Well, the Chinese version is a little different. Gorbachev is the man who abandoned the Communist Party, ruined his country, led the devastation, and the not so subtle message is it won't happen here. The fall of the Soviet Union still casts a long shadow in Beijing. And if President Xi had been unable to control the COVID-19 virus, I believe it would have posed a threat to party legitimacy. Those of you that know Chinese history will recall that disease, famines, natural disasters often foretold the end of dynasties. In contrast, I think today Xi feels China has had relative success, but he's still defensive about some of the initial problems they face. Second, China's approach to the world. I would describe it as globalization with Chinese characteristics. And it's followed two tracks. One is to work within the existing institutions, the international financial institutions, the WTO, the UN bodies, WHO, to push forward Chinese interests and norms. Now, frankly, this shouldn't be a surprise. It's common practice for many countries. Mm -hmm. Probably the surprise is that over the past years, the U.S. has been less active in those institutions and has somewhat abandoned uh, the field, although the Trump administration is now recognizing some of that and pushing back in whether it was the Intellectual Property Institution or ITU or others. But there's a second track of Chinese policy, which is in the Chinese tradition of tributary states. And here the logic is that partners will receive benefits as long as they show respect to China. There certainly should be no criticism of the Chinese Communist Party. The Belt and Road is an example of this. It's an infrastructure-led development model. China is also pursuing the same idea with information and data systems with uh, state controls. I suspect that Xi feels he will need to moderate some of the propaganda overreach and the heavy-handed response to international critics. He, as a student of Chinese history, recognizes that past spasms of patriotic or party fervor, for example, in the Boxer Rebellion or the Cultural Revolution, actually scared the world. And we'll have some opportunity to see this because there are two important Congresses in China that will begin around May 20th. Third, U.S. politics in China. Trump's confrontation with China focused initially on the trade deficit. As many of you are well aware, he believes bilateral trade deficits are bad and he's been trying to overcome them. So earlier this year, he achieved a purchase package. <clears throat> this, the results of this package were always questionable in my view, and now they're a fantasy. He needs to shift blame in an election year because this will otherwise primarily be a referendum election on his performance but he will still have some restraint because he doesn't want to have such a break with China that it interferes with the economic re recovery. Now, other Republicans will expand the course. They will focus on some issues that are not high on Trump's agenda, human rights, Hong Kong, internal behavior, Taiwan, 
security in the South China Sea, the other economic issues, or as the Secretary of State has talked about, the Wuhan virus. Now, the objectives of these criticisms aren't totally clear, something we can come to. There seems to be an interest in decoupling. I don't believe you could contain China. You can add costs to China, but at what price? So one of the aspects of the U.S. debate will be, while there's an animosity towards China, what do you really want to accomplish? Now, the Democrats, on the other hand, particularly in an election year, cannot be seen as soft on China. And many of their members had a protectionist orientation on trade anyway. So you'll see them try to be more multilateral, but it'll be somewhat fuzzy in their positions. I would expect the rhetoric to worsen in the campaign, but I do believe there'll have to be some fluidity beyond that next year because realism will intrude. Now the fourth point, <clears throat> and one that's important for Europeans to appreciate, there's a new conventional wisdom in the US about past experience with China. And that view is <clears throat> that cooperation with China failed. As Rudiger mentioned, I wrote an article earlier this year in a journal called The National Interest that challenged this position, but it's important for you to recognize that mine is definitely a minority view. What I sought to explain was that over past decades, China had gone from being a wartime enemy to being a help in dealing with proliferation of weapons of mass destruction and missiles, cooperated with sanctions on Iran and North Korea. From 2000 to 2018, China supported UN sanctions in 182 of 190 cases, prodded by the United States. China is an active participant in UN peacekeeping. It helped deal with the Darfur genocide, something I dealt with 15 years ago. It's been the largest contributor to global economic growth. The current account surplus shrank from 10% to about zero, adding to domestic to international demand. China no longer manipulates its exchange rate. It was the fastest growing destination for US exports for 15 years until Trump. During the global financial crisis, it had the largest fastest stimulus, had good cooperation with the IMF and World Bank, where I was at the time. Even on the subject of WTO commitments, the story is somewhat mixed. The China made deeper commitments than most other developing countries. It generally met its numerical obligations, but it was weaker on topics such, that are harder to measure, such as intellectual property rights enforcement. On climate change, China certainly recognizes the issue. The melting Himalayas would cause a disaster for China. It's been an innovator on non-fossil fuel technology, but it is the largest emitter. On conservation topics, uh, to an area of my personal interest, China won a lot of fans by banning elephant ivory, but it still permits illegal wildlife trade. And I think in the aftermath of the pandemic, you'll see more concern about the danger of viruses and wildlife trade. Even on Taiwan, a very sensitive subject in the United States, if you go back to the discussions that Kissinger and Nixon had with China some 50 years ago, I think one would be surprised to see China today as a democracy uh, operating with freedom. Uh, some over the past 50 years, China has uh, operated with some reluctant restraint, certainly based on U.S. deterrence. But my point is, we shouldn't take these things for granted. And I'm not saying that all is well. We face big problems with China, which we can discuss. But the key point is, those who claim that cooperation with China failed are flat wrong. They're misleading themselves. And the reality is there's no holidays from the work of diplomacy. And so that leads me to the final and fifth point. Europe's role could prove quite vital in this relationship. Europe has enjoyed China's benefits, but also it's seen the sharp teeth of the dragon. I expect most Europeans don't want to become Chinese tributary states, but perhaps they could accommodate a benign neutralism. So I believe the US would be very wise to shape a common agenda with the European Union and the UK. But we need to recognize a changing set of challenges. So my quick list would include biological security, including biotechnology, an inclusive economic recovery with opportunity and security, environmental and energy security, digital security and innovation, proliferation of weapons of mass destruction to hostile regional hegemons, tear law enforcement of public order 
the future of freedom, and the future of China. The U.S. hasn't approached these topics wisely, and it'll be an important question for Europeans about whether they can shape a strategic perspective on this or other agendas. Thank you, Bob. If that was it, let me just follow up with one short question, which you sort of not avoided, but you didn't mention it. Will the stance of our stance towards China change by sort of now thinking about their coping with the crisis and what uh, Trump calls the Wuhan virus? Has that changed our meaning and our feeling about China to ch change it maybe to the negative? Well, it depends on who you mean by R. If you mean Europe and Germany or the West? The West. Well, I think that's a subject of debate. Uh, I think the Australians have led an effort, which I think is correct, to try to investigate the ultimate cause of this. Um, I think the reality is that in part because of Xi's centralized control that I referred to, we all know how communist systems work, is the people in, in Wuhan probably were afraid to report bad news up the chain. Uh, there were some heavy handed efforts. I think the world is generally aware of these. I think the problem from my point of view is if you want China to change, trying to embarrass or insult it's not the best way to do this. So I think China has its own reasons to get to the bottom of these. I was referring to wildlife markets, some of the different issues. So I think that more broadly, Rudiger, that the Chinese propaganda campaigns and the overreach and attitude towards any critics will cause them some problems. And I suspect there's a debate within China right now. It will be interesting to see how President Xi uh, sort of plays this out. Uh, most of you are familiar with sort of American colloquialism. Uh, in my diplomatic experience, if a foe is digging a hole, the best thing to do is let them keep digging rather than sort of get in their way. So in this case, we're seeing some of the aspects of China, but what I come back to is the key point. Whatever the agenda, pandemics, environment, uh, proliferation, I don't think you're gonna be very successful unless you work with China. So the, the challenge here is to stay true to our values, and I believe one can in terms of uh, both the, the rhetoric and, and our own positions, what we do at home, but also see where we can find common ground. And as I mentioned, I think one of the problems in the US is people have overlooked the common ground and the mutual interests that have been achieved over the past decades. Common ground now is the key word for Europe. Uh, Stormy, I mean, we all know that Germany has been benefited most from China trade, as well as uh, have, have other, other states within the European community. But now we are sort of questions and challenged to find a coherent China strategy. What's our answer? What's your take on what Bob said? Well, thank you so much. Um, I think I am still mute. Am I unmuted? Yes. Okay. We're doing okay. it Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Of course, my little uh, microphone still shows that I'm on mute, but that is, uh, that is, that is perfect. Um, I would like to do two things. And thanks so much um, for those uh, um, really insightful introductory remarks. Um, what I wanted to do is uh, two things. Uh, first of all, I wanted to look at how um, the COVID-19 crisis is changing the, the global economy. Um, if that is really something new we are seeing or if it's just um, more or less fueling trends we have already seen in the past. Um, and then also try to answer the question what that means for Europe and what we have to do to deal with this, uh, with this situation. Um, and a lot of times um, you could hear or you could read um, that the crisis means the end of globalization. And I don't agree with this, but it is changing how we do business internationally um, and it is changing global value chains. Um, and is that something new? No, it's not. Um, and I would like to point out five trends which we have seen in the past, which the EU has to deal with to stay an actor um, in the world economy. Uh, and the first trend is global value chains have been changing for a few years. There is more relocalization, there is more re-regionalization. Um, and um, if we look at just data and a simple indicator, um, the relationship of trade to GDP 
which grew massively in the 1990s, has been pretty stagnant or even going back a little bit um, since the last financial and economic crisis. And the COVID-19 um, crisis is going to fuel this relocation and the re, um, re regionalization. We will see a steep drop of trade um, this year and next year um, of up to 32%. And companies are um, really struggling with um, the practice which we had in the past with just-in-time production that just doesn't work anymore. There will be more stockpiling, there will be more redundancies, and there will be more local production. So the value chains are changing and we will also see a steep, steep drop um, in foreign direct investment um, this year. And we should not expect, unlike in the last financial and economic crisis, that the emerging economies are going to pull us out of the crisis through trade and investment because they're just as hit, just as hard hit as we are. And there is also a asymmetric course of the crisis. So while we might already get out of it, many other countries are just getting into it. Um, so global value chains are changing and that is fueled by the crisis. The second trend, which we've been witnessing for quite a while, is that we see a lot of nationalisms, go it alone strategies, protectionism, since the last financial economic crisis, there has been, I would call it a creeping protectionism, more and more measures being um, implemented. Um, just a figure here, the WTO has registered more than 1,600 new trade restrictive me measures since the last financial and economic crisis. And we have seen lots of new measures during the corona crisis, not so much import restrictions, but export restrictions, because many countries feel they do not have the necessary amount to counter the crisis and need to restrict the export of protective gear, of certain chemicals or certain pharmaceuticals um, to have enough at home to tackle the crisis. Um, the WTO estimates that about 80 countries have implemented new export restrictions. The third trend is that our multilateral trading system, which I'm a huge fan of, um, I'm, I'm a really big fan of the WTO and I would defend it anywhere as the guardian of, of rules-based open trade, but it is pretty badly equipped to deal with um, the two trends I've just referred to. Um, the WTO is an intergovernmental organization. It's only as good as its members are. And the members have not updated um, the WTO's powers and rule book for a long time. So its rules do not um, reflect or represent trade um, as we see it today. And it cannot counter neither with its transparency mechanisms nor with its enforcement mechanisms can counter that creeping um, protectionism. And what's more, um, there are a lot of reform proposals on the table. The US, I have to say, has not sufficiently joined the reform debates. Um, some other countries are also not so keen um, on engaging. I'm thinking about India, for example, South Africa, but also, um, also China. Um, but what it's really, I mean, the, the biggest challenge right now is the blockage of the uh, trade dispute um, settlement mechanism, the appellate body, um, which has ceased functioning since December um, last year. Um, there's another thing which we have been witnessing new new bilateral trade agreements, nothing wrong with those in principle. Uh, the EU has, uh, has concluded many of these. They can be a wonderful supplement if they function according to open trade, rules-based, transparent, and so on. And some of the new ideas, I would say, are not going into the direction. And I'm referring to the phase one deal between the United States and China, which I would say is more a managed trade deal than a free trade deal. The fourth trend, which is problematic, is an, I would say, an unhealthy meddling of trade policy, industrial policy, national security policy, all mixing it together and leading to new trade restrictions. I'm thinking about export controls, screening of foreign direct investment, um, and uh, for example, the entity list in the United States, all highly, highly problematic. And last trend is, I, um, what we have been witnessing, and which is also exacerbated by the crisis, is that the consensus for liberal and open markets and that trade contributes to 
economic growth, well-being, and jobs, that consensus has been eroding for quite a long time. And we see it in this crisis as well. The first impulse is looking inside. So what does that mean for, for the European Union? Um, it means um, that we have to put even more effort in defending, I would say, the multilateral trading system and also stand up for open markets, not erect trade barriers ourselves. And we have done that during the crisis. We are among the countries which erected export controls for, for protective gear. I think we shouldn't have done this. But at the second, uh, um, but on the other hand, we also need to revisit our trade policy instruments. And that's where I come back to what Bob said. There are a lot of areas where we can work together um, on investment screening, on export controls, um, on WTO reform. The list is really long. And um, the, the challenge we are facing, however, in the EU, that we need to speak with one voice. And we do really have to do our own homework. Um, may it be on, Ch on China policy, but also on many other issues. We, um, we have divergent views in the EU and we have to overcome this to be a equal player vis-a-vis -vis the EU and vis-a-vis uh, -vis the US and China. Thank you very much, Stormy, for that uh, sort of very factual view on, on the current crisis and not only on the crisis, but the many facts involved. But let me put a question forward to both of you, because you said uh, the WTO is a great institution, should be reformed, but can it be reformed? And is the European Union a strong enough player to play a role on those in these talks? Because as we all know, the Americans are not only staying aside, they are officially even opposing the work of the WTO. And as Bob always says and writes, uh, he, he says we need more flexibility we, we can't go back to autarky. We need multilateral institutions. But the question to both of you is, how can we do it? And is European up to the task to play a role? And will America play a constructive role in the future? Bob, you first. Uh, well, Stormy can more accurately speak to what Europe can accomplish uh, in the WTO. Um, I think the the frank reality is the Trump administration and Ambassador Lighthizer um, have never liked the WTO dispute settlement. As trade people on this call will, re will recall, um, under the GATT system, you had a dispute system, but you had the ability of parties to block panel reports. That's what they would prefer to go back to. So I don't really think they will play a constructive role. Now, a different administration uh, might be willing to do so, but this goes to my point where I think um, if President Biden is elected, he will have some difficulties with protectionist uh, uh, constituencies in his own party. Traditionally, they were actually the more protectionist. And so the question is um, whether the European Union, Canada, Australia, Japan, I've even had quiet discussions with this on the Chinese side, uh, could come forward with some constructive suggestions about dealing with some of the issues. Um, and here, I'll build a little bit off what, what Stormy has said, and I agree with, with all her points. It is interesting, however, that you're seeing, <clears throat> while the manufactured trade has slowed down, the services trade has picked up about 60%. And services trade is about 20% of the total, probably more if you include uh, intercompany set of transfers. Um, but the rules for services are not anyway are where are what they have been for manufacturing areas. Um, you're seeing technology shifts uh, and one of the big issues will be the effect of 3D printing. I think as my friend Pascal Lamy, the former uh, head of the WTO and EC Trade Commissioner focuses on, I think the pandemic will create interest in what he would refer to as precautionary policies, safety regulations, standard certification, licensing. There's always the risk that producers will hijack this for protectionism. Um, as Stormy said, you're gonna get changing supply chains anyway. The question is whether people try to go towards strategic autonomy or autarky or whether they try to adapt in the ways that she mentioned. Um, and you're gonna get huge government intervention. So issues that in Europe would be called state aid or subsidies in other places, the question of <clears throat> regulations on those topics. 
And frankly, one I think you would see from both Europe and a Democratic Party in the US would be the role of carbon border taxes, which the commission has already sort of raised as an issue. So I think one will also probably need to have more flexibility uh, in when industries get hit. Uh, one possible use of this was what's called the safeguard mechanism as opposed to the anti-dumping countervailing duty suits. So um, I think that there could be an agenda as somebody who likes to be an activist to get things done, I could imagine one. Um, whether some countries will go along, that is an open question. But in that event, I would go back to the method that I started to try to use 20 years ago, which is a combination of multilateral and regional agreements to advance the, the state of the art. But I think the, the reality for your audience is um, one has to expect, as Stormy said, the risk of more managed trade versus open trade, more frictions. And the sad thing is this will slow down the recovery and this will lead to greater poverty. So I believe to, to close this point, Rudiger, Rudiger, I think that the European Union is probably the biggest economy that could play an active role in this. But as is always the case, you would need to build partnerships uh, with other trading countries. And I think a different US administration might be brought along, but it would depend if Europe put this high on its agenda because a new democratic administration is gonna have a lot of priorities to deal with. Thanks for that outlook, Bob. And now back to Stormy. Uh, does Europe have the muscles to step into the playing field and, and, game, and play the game, <clears throat> as I asked before? And the intention? Yeah. Uh, we certainly have the intention, um, and I think that the EU um, has played a constructive role in WTO reform by putting down um, a lot of reform proposals also together with the United States. And I think um, a really good approach is the trilateral initiative of the United States, the European Union and Japan. And that's exactly what the EU needs to do. It's build coalitions. Um, it can't, I mean, it cannot do it by itself. Um, but certainly if we team up with the United States and if we team up with Japan, we can push forward um, reform. Um, Bob? <laughs> Bob? I was just gonna add two more points. One, um, I think if the US continues uh, to pull out, I, I would certainly encourage the European Union and others to proceed as they did with an alternative appellate mechanism. Um, I think, you know, if, if the US is stupid, that doesn't mean everybody else should slow down. And that can create some pressure on the US side as well. And the one other topic we didn't mention, but I want to highlight because I think it's very important for Europe's relations with Africa and others, is the trade finance system is also getting badly squeezed. This happened in the global financial crisis, and Lamy and I worked with the bankers to overcome that. I'm not sure people are doing that today. Thank you, Bob. Now I would like to play in a short uh, questionnaire, which also covers up what we already have been discussing about the post-COVID-19 scenario and what is most likely. Please, uh, can uh, you pull it up? This, these are the questions, and you can all join in in answering them. Which post-COVID-19 scenario is most likely that the global economy will enter an extended recession. Second, be impacted negatively by a growing, growing great power competition, especially China and the US. And thirdly, go back to normal in 2021. We'll pull it up as soon as everybody has answered. And now back to you, Stormy, because I think you were just stopped in middle of your talk, what you wanted to say. Please, Tommy. No, no problem at all. Um, um, I just saw that we can vote um, as, as speakers, um, but I'm certainly going look, looking forward to uh, seeing the results. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Now, I think, I think that the way forward really is, as Bob said, um, flexibility. Um, and I remember that bef before the Uruguay round of the GATT, um, there was a very flexible approach under the GATT. There were different codes, uh, plurilateral agreements, which countries could sign up to. Um, and um, while that led to very different rules for different countries, um, and the Uruguay round really overcame this with one big umbrella agreement. I think we have to go back to this more flexible um, approach and look at plurilateral agreements. And I see quite a bit of progress with regard to um, digital trade, e-commerce. There might be something in there 
but also um, a plurilateral agreement either in the WTO or outside on subsidies and countervailing duties, um, state-owned enterprises, mm -hmm. this might be a way forward. And last but not least, also it, a, an agreement to reduce tariffs on pharmaceuticals during the crisis as well as on my medical products. And the EU is actually pushing a lot on those initiatives. Thank you very much, Lumi. We have to stop it here because I think I would now like all the guests uh, being becoming and being able to engage themselves. I see already 10 questions and I will call up upon the first one. Uh, it's from Patrick. It seems to me that in realpolitik, the one with the longer level led, lever leads acceptable policy. In addition, many young Chinese being educated at EU, EU universities uh, had a good knowledge and inside knowledge of our capabilities. How do you estimate the EU leverage and its dealings with China? That question goes to Stormy. And please answer it short, shortly. Stormy? Yes, um, I thought that the second question goes to me, um, but I can also um, certainly say about um, our, our relationship. Well, I, I would say that in the European Union, there has been a change um, of policy or outlook towards uh, China in the last couple of years. We were very positive for a long time that China would change um, and would eventually open up. Um, and um, that has not come through. And since the last, I would say for the last couple of three years, um, there is a um, much greater willingness within the EU to counter unfair um, practices in, in China and to think more about um, reducing our vulnerabilities also with regard to global value chains. Um, and that also refers to 5G. Um, but what I have to say is we would not go, I, I'm pretty sure that European business as a whole would not go as far as talking about decoupling um, because we depend um, on the Chinese market. It is an important partner. Um, and as Bob said, there is no holiday in, or vacation in diplomacy. There is also no holiday or vacation in, in uh, economic business relations. Um, there is no, we, we have to deal with China. And I see <laughs> I'm too long. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a question from Detlef Schwarting to Bob. How much damage can, <coughs> could uh, the US government make, Ameri make China responsible uh, for the COVID-19 crisis and ask for, uh, for what is it, wait, liability. It's the question about liability of the Chinese government. Can you answer it shortly? You, you, you will hear that. Some state attorneys general are pushing it. Some members of Congress will push it. Um, I, I don't know the basis under either US law or international law. And of course, the Chinese won't play along. And the Chinese will then find the things that they want to complain about in the US. So I think that that's a good example of the type of posturing you're going to see that I don't think uh, will be uh, implemented. Um, but there will be other things, for example, in the export restrictions area. It's in the news today, limiting the ability of the federal pension fund to invest in Chinese equities. There will be steps that will be taken, and the Chinese will likely respond to a degree in kind. Short question to, <laughs> to Stormy from Patrick. Automotive industry has been the peak industry of the past. What will be the future industry after the peak industry is in default? Ah, that if I knew, <laughs> there are lots of challenges um, in the auto industry, um, not just because of the corona crisis and the interrupted um, value chains, but before that as well. Um, I, I would say, um, it, I mean, it's definitely not the end of that sector, but it, it is uh, undergoing a big, big um, reform process um, and we have to modernize and also take into account different changes uh, with regard to um, consumer preferences. Question from Frank Sportolari, and I think it goes to you, Bob, uh, as a banker and as a former world banker, and now I have to look it up again, the increased danger of deflation because of protectionism and decoupling from the world. Is there something the Americans and especially American economists should be concerned of? Well, there's a debate in the US as there is in Europe about whether 
the extraordinary monetary policies could actually lead to inflation. The general view is not likely, although this always depends on um, in the nature of recovery, whether there's bottlenecks on the supply chains uh, going forward. Um, and of course, money has to be turned into credit. On the deflationary side, um, I think that all the actions that we're talking about um, could actually raise prices because protectionism uh, lessens efficiency, but the real cost will be to productivity and to the basis for future growth coming out of this. So I think, um, again, what I, would not, what I would emphasize is we shouldn't take the gains of the past for granted. There's some very serious risks here that we will sort of build in more and more barriers, more and more autarky, more and more limitations. In a sense, you could see a political tension between calls for national resilience versus global resilience. Global resilience is based on sort of greater movement of capital and people and ideas. But the system, and this is an important point for Europe, the system won't, won't go away in terms of globalization. So frankly, if, if you're not going to allow trade and growth and development in sub-Saharan Africa, get ready for migration. Let me now call up the answers to our second, to our questionnaire. <coughs> Can, yes, please. 51% fear that we will enter an extended recession. 35% think we will be impacted negatively by a growing great power competition. And only 14% think that we will go back to normal in 2021. Uh, thank you. I think that resonates what you, Bob, said earlier. It will follow us for a long time. Here comes another question uh, from Fred Irwin to Bob, old friend of yours, as I know. The Transatlantic Economic Council has been somewhat quiet in the past. Do you see any opportunity to revive it and have a greater impact on transatlantic relations? Greetings from Fred. Well, thanks for the question, Fred. Um, I as I've suggested, um, the, the, the U.S. business community, of course, it's, it's disparate, but there's a lot of anxiety about protectionism in the United States. And there's a lot of concern about upsetting the types of business arrangements. But at the same time, as Stormy mentioned, they know they're going to have to change in terms of flexibility of supply chains, resilience, inventories. It does matter a great deal by sector. And I think you're going to see very different sectoral performances. Um, you're going to see that the digital platform world, I think, will continue to expand and do quite well. Um, you know, where if you're in tourism, if you're in uh, uh, sort of airlines and some of the, the, those sectors, you're going to be, be suffering more. But And I think the key point on the US European side is even when you saw the changes that Stormy referred to in supply chains, you were seeing greater reliance on high skilled labor and data being the critical driving issue. And there are some very sensitive issues <clears throat> between the United States or North America and Europe about some of these data questions. Um, I think both sides have respectable positions and concerns, but I think that would be an important topic <clears throat> to try to address in a transatlantic agenda. But I'll also come back to the other point I've tried to make before. I think insofar as European and American businesses and other constituencies can come up with a constructive agenda, if you have a change of administrations, you might find some willingness on this. I think some of their ideas are in Kuwait, and if you can come up with win-win solutions, this is the time to, to do that. From a win-win to a problem, uh, the Huawei problem. Question from Tyson to, uh, let me go back here. Where is it, Tyson? Uh, to Stormy, Bob mentioned precautionary policies, which in the EU are enshrined as principles in the Lisbon Treaty. Why hasn't the precautionary principle play a bigger role in the EU countries 5G equipment sourcing, especially concerning Huawei? That's a question for Stormy. Yeah, uh, Tyson, you could answer that question probably better yourself than I, I can. I think it's um, a test. <laughs> it's, it's a test. Um, <laughs> um, I would really say that the precautionary principle 
is a scientific principle um, and it is rooted in proving really that there is a risk to either health or national security. And for a long time, um, the evaluation came, I would say, to the conclusion that China was not such a risk factor. But that is, uh, that is changing and the perception is certainly changing. Will the future US administration be willing to change its views on China because they want to define a common EU-US concept? Or does it mean that a common position by Washington is defined by following US lead, which was the practice during the last years? So it's more or less others question that as well. Will we have a common agenda or will the China question divide us further? So since Karsten has a good sense of this historically, let me give you the context for my thinking. Uh, I, I engage in a video set of sessions with uh, former Secretary Henry Kissinger. And he's very much focused on this issue as I am about whether Europe can develop a strategic perspective because we actually feel that the transatlantic relationship works best when both parties bring their ideas to the context. Now, uh, at times as a US official, this can be very frustrating. It can be the different complexities in negotiation. But Karsten, uh, obviously for it to work, if you take the agenda that I sort of outlined, there would have to be uh, a, a two-way street. Now, that doesn't mean you're gonna agree on everything, but if you're, if you're thinking about this strategically for the long term, some alignment between the US and Europe on these questions, I think is, is fundamental. The risk, I mean, let me be more, more uh, provocative. The risk, of course, was be that Europe doesn't get its act together. And in a sense, while it's large on economic topics, it gets manipulated, including by China and other players or Russia and others. And that the US moves back to its historical role as kind of an island power. And, and, and what you could actually see is a world that looks much more like the world of 1900. In that world, the US, China, uh, India uh, will be significant. Japan will have to have a relationship between North America and, and, uh, um, and China. Uh, Russia will have a role because of its simple geography. Europe will certainly have a role economically. Will it have a role politically and strategically? Hard to say. But that's a very different world than the one we've operated in in the past 70 years. So part of my message is don't take these things for granted. We can't go back to the way we were, but let's try to see if we can reestablish that type of network for a different era. Thank you very much. Next question comes from Val, Valbona Senali, and it uh, sort of covers what already has been mentioned by both of you, the policy of reshoring some of our sort of production facilities in China to our own, uh, let's say, countries. Uh, US is thinking more about Mexico, and we are thinking about our backyard. Question is, would Eastern Europe and the Balkan countries being included in the future, new European regional, regionalized supply chains? Question goes to Stormy. Um, I certainly would, would expect so. Um, we shouldn't forget anyways that um, a big, big percentage of European trade takes place with, within the European area anyways already. Um, about 60% of EU trade takes place within the EU. So yes, I think um, that companies are going to um, look towards neighbors a little bit more. Having said this, I would not propose trying to exchange regional um, or global value chains with regional value chains. There is a huge advantage in division of labor. And um, we also benefit from economic development in other countries. And there was a question on, on Africa, for example, um, and on, on development in other regions. And this, this, this local thinking alone, that won't help the recovery at all. Um, and if we want to keep our prosperity, we have to think global and not just local and regionally. A gloomy question from Michael Backfish, who was a former correspondent in Washington. His question goes to Bob. Uh, President Trump recently mentioned or threatened he could stop relations with China. And Steve Bannon has even predicted that the US would be at war with China one day. Is that only election rhetoric, Bob? Well, I certainly hope so. Um, 
I, I don't think either party really wants to get into uh, physical conflict on this, which would be disastrous for them and the world. However, one of the worries I have is that the rhetoric and behavior on both sides runs the risk of miscalculation. Um, and so one has to be careful about losing the framework in which you try to find uh, pursuit of match mutual interests with the other party. More particularly, to, again, to help Europeans try to understand Trump, um, look, there are some fundamentals of his behavior that go to his core political constituency. You've seen them, anti-immigration and the mm -hmm. wall, trade and protectionism, but another one is actually getting out of foreign conflicts. So I don't think Trump mm -hmm. is actually interested in future conflicts. If I were from a European perspective, I might be a little bit more concerned about whether he's going to be engaged in European security and what your alternative might be. An interesting question from Klaus Whitman, which follows on with what you just said about the future role of China. You both argued for keeping the channels open, keep all diplomatic ties and try to sort of civilize our, our international system and have them as partners. Here comes the question. He says, might China not already be beyond that point because living in a certain hubris of what they already have achieved. You want me to start? Yeah, please. Yeah, uh, I, I think that's an excellent question. I think there's some risk of that. Um, I think that some, the reason I started out with President Xi's behavior starting in 2012 was that I do think there was a shift in terms of internal policy and, and hubris. Um, and I think that uh, the U.S. action has probably led the Chinese leadership as a whole to be doubtful whether they can rely on the U.S. relationship in future years. But having said that, in my experience, Chinese officials are very practical. They have their own huge internal problems. Um, to be successful in the international economy, they're going to need to have some reciprocal sort of relationship. To be successful in dealing with pandemics, to be successful in dealing with terrorism, the nine border states that they have sometimes with conflicts, including with India. Um, so I think there are, and environmental issues, as I've mentioned. So I think one of the parts that has been missed in some of the US debate is that I do believe there's a way to find allies around the world that can bring the message to China, but also within China. My experience on many of these issues is that you will find forces within China that recognize it's in their interest to work on these topics. So I, I'm not trying to be starry-eyed. I'm not, I, the reason I started out with the nature of the Communist Party is and people in Germany certainly would recognize this. You need to understand the sort of the core set of beliefs in that system. On the other hand, there is a record where cooperation is a benefit. And coming back a little bit to the defense point, I'll flag this for a German audience. You're starting to get some discussion here about the nature of the US defense posture. We've relied very heavily on aircraft carriers, uh, sophisticated planes, platforms. There's a book that just came out by Christopher Brose, who worked for John McCain for many years called The Kill Chain. And what he's basically arguing is how the US has to adopt military, different types of information technology in a distributed system, but this has a security implication. It moves more towards the notion of deterrence and defense than it does offensive capabilities. You will see these parts come into the US debate. And so I think the bigger challenge is, really comes back to some of the values issues that I expect is the case in Germany. And that is, for example, I don't believe that uh, just because you seek to cooperate with China on some of these issues, that you shouldn't speak out, for example, on the violations of their accord with Hong Kong, or you shouldn't speak out against what they're doing to Uyghurs in, in, uh, in Zhejiang province, um, or other aspects of human rights or freedom of religion. However, Ronald Reagan was quite skillful in doing those as a notion of aspirations for people, as opposed to insulting the public. And I think one of the things we're at risk of losing is having worked with Chinese over 20 or 30 years, I found a lot of younger Chinese that admired the US and Europe, and I'm afraid we're now turning them against. So I think there's a way you can stand for our values, cooperate, but also play for the long run. 
Thank you very much. Uh, we have another five minutes to go and I would like to play out the last questionnaire which, which sort of concentrates and focuses on the future and maybe mutual concerns. Here are the questions. Which of the following are you most concerned about? China's policy on human rights, China's growing tech, tech power, a trade war with China, or fourth, a global confrontation between China and the US. And please let us feel the pulse of all one, over 100 who are still participating in these transatlantic and global talks. Last question, Yuri Schneider from Espen, from Espen, Central Europe in Prague. Yuri asks, the EU is not only challenged from outside, it is also challenged from the inside. And he makes it a point that the most recent decision of the German Constitutional Court challenging jurisdiction of the European uh, Court is one of those symbols. I think I know other ones in Hungary and other countries, but let it stay. So here is his question. Is there a change the US will return to long-term policy of supporting European unity as whole and free, or will the future administration still try to see Europe more as a foe or an adversary or a competitor than a partner? Bob, you are well-versed in that subject. Well, I think the reality, and it doesn't give me comfort to say this, but uh, President Trump tends to see Europe through nation states, not through the European Union. And many Americans still have difficulty understanding the shared sovereignty concept of the European Union. This isn't a surprise. I think many Europeans have a hard time understanding some of the institutions as well. Um, I think that uh, in general, even for other Americans, there's a belief that this should be Europe's business. So Europe's not, uh, the US should not play an interfering role. If I had to say, I would look for ways to try to be cooperative privately and prodding through both European institutions um, and uh, through the nation states. And let me just flag one topic that hasn't even come up, but it's gonna be very important. What about Brexit? You know, Europe used to include Britain. I think Britain is going to be a player, uh, could be a player, but it's got its own internal issues for sort of going forward. So I think the U.S. could do a lot with the type of dialogue I'm talking about, trade policies, frankly, arrangements with Britain, uh, to try to, as it had historically, ease the context for European integration and Europe dealing with some of these problems. But ultimately, the decision is all up to you. Last question goes to Mike Hotzler. I now have it in writing, and thank you, Mike, for that one. Uh, and I would like to pose it to, to Stormy. It's Europe. Are you concerned about China's de facto purchase of the Port of Piraeus and by its 17 plus one initiative and its support for authoritarian European leaders like uh, Alexander Vucic? Doesn't it thus pose a threat to fundamental European values? Um, yes, I would, I would very much agree that there is a serious threat. Um, and as Bob said, um, we need to get our act together. Um, and um, we, sometimes we are our biggest, our own biggest stumbling block, um, not being able to form a consolidated um, European approach. And I think this is, this is one of the initiatives um, where we do have to have a consolidated approach by our own connectivity strategy, working maybe with the United States on the Blue Dot initiative to have a counter to the Belt and Road initiative. But sometimes we seem not to be quite there yet. The very last question goes to Dietrich von Kiau, a long-standing senior diplomat, former ambassador to Brussels. He asks Bob, to win the US as partner on WTO, does the EU need to put pressure on them via alternative partnerships? Is that too risky? Could that backfire? And who might those partners be? That might also be a question for Stormy. <laughs> Bob. Well, I don't, think, I don't think Europe should pursue it in a confrontational style. But I think Europe should pursue its own and its systemic interest. As I mentioned with the reworking of the appellate body, as Europe has done with some of its bilateral agreements. Uh, it, it worries me actually that Europe's got its own internal challenges as we saw with the Canada agreement and you're gonna see with your Brazil agreement and other issues. 
But so I wouldn't set it up as trying to be hostile to the U.S., but I would explain that there are alternatives. And if the U.S. takes certain actions that Europe regretfully will pursue its own interests to try to keep the system going while always keeping a hand open for those in the U.S. who want to work with it. Last answer or last comment goes to Stormy. Stormy, you have the last word. <laughs> um, as Bob said, with the interweam arbitration mechanism, this is exactly the right strategy, I would say. Pursue our interests, but extend an open invitation as soon as you are ready to join, come in and join us. And now let's uh, see what the future will uh, have hold in their hand for it for us. Please come up with the answers of our second questionnaire. Oops, 44% global confrontation between China and the US. Bob, you could have done better. <laughs> Keep us safe. Trade war with China, only 9%. China's growing technological power, 36%. China's policy on human rights, only 11% are concerned about that. And let me say now, thank you to all of you. We tried to answer as many questions. There were some more which we couldn't answer in time. But let me say this will not be the last discussion, neither on that topic neither with those two excellent participants and guests of honor. Thank you, Stormy, and thank you, Bob. It's good to have two strong free marketers and, and transatlanticists within the Espen family. We need you more than ever. And with that, I say goodbye. I say goodbye to all over 100 who still stood with us. This, I think, is in itself a great success, and we are Grateful to you both. Thank you. Thanks, Rudiger. Wiedersehen, Rudiger. Thank you. Have a good Auf weekend. All the best to both of you. Yeah, you too, and stay healthy. Yeah.